Hello, this is Alfie Wattam from the Alfie Wattam Technology Podcast. As always, we are here sponsored by Alpha Technology. If you are a software developer in the UK looking for your next opportunity, or if you're an engineering manager or a CTO or in recruitment and you're looking to hire the best of the best developers on the market, then we love alpha.com. A-L-F-A is the place to go to get the top talent that you need to grow your team and the best opportunities out there to grow your career. Um, Sponsors of the Alpha podcast. Today, we are here with Laura. Uh, Laura, do you want to just give us a little bit of an intro and tell us about yourself? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on, Alfie. I am Laura. I'm the senior engineering manager at a company called Apolitical. Um, We've built the the world's first learning platform for global public servants. So we have public servants from all over the world that come to our site for um, sharing knowledge, upskilling online courses, sharing ideas with each other, just trying to help uh, people in government do their jobs more effectively and stay motivated. Um, Prior to working at Apolitical, I've worked in legal tech and health tech in the past. Uh, My degree was in computer science, artificial intelligence, and I've been working in tech in London for the guts of a decade now and that's kind of been in a nutshell cool 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 the the government tech world isn't doesn't get like as much i suppose energy and attention from a lot of development teams as as other areas so awesome to see that you guys are doing some some pretty exciting work in that area thanks it's really worthwhile work as well it's really nice to see the feedback that we get from users and the impact that it makes on their jobs as well um government is one of the largest workforces in the world and a lot of people in government just don't get access to the training the skills they need and end up demotivated so we're trying to bridge that gap cool 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 so i've got some political tech news kind of happening around the world that i'm keen to explore with you today so um, first article up on the screen um so biden sets to sign law to pump 53 billion into u.s chip manufacturing i think we all know why this is happening but the boost for u.s uh, chip making is part of a broader 280 billion chips and science act fear of chinese manufacturing power is part of the impetus um so president biden will sign the chips and science act of 2022 into law that was yesterday in the rose garden ceremony the white house said in a press statement on wednesday a move that would flood 52 billion into funding for us chip makers over the next five years um obviously a pretty hot potato in the world at the moment but um probably a smart thing for the us to do because like all of the chips in the world are made in in taiwan and and in china right so we kind of need to have manufacturing of these critical components in other areas of the world i mean i remember with with covid it was you couldn't get a a new mouse or a new computer because of you know the supply chain being shut down but what what are your thoughts on this uh, laura I have really conflicted thoughts about this. So on the one hand, I think anything that brings supply chain closer to home for the people is always a good thing. Uh, We rely on chips so much in our day-to-day life and they're crying out for better chips, better technology in the likes of the military and the healthcare. So all for that. Um, The idea of creating jobs with the local economy is only going to be a boost to the economy as well. On the flip side, I think it's disappointing that major world powers can't trust each other and this has become an issue and that's worrying especially given the state of the world these days um moreover than that the some of the largest chip makers about a year ago sent a letter to biden asking for this to come into effect and i think intel has spent something like 100 million on campaigns and lobbying to try and okay make this happen so that's a pretty good investment on their part given that they'll probably get the lion's share of this sure yeah um and in the past, some of these companies like Intel, Texas in- Instruments and so on have gotten tax credits and have gotten incentives to to create local factories, but then eventually have moved those abroad, resulting in the loss of thousands of jobs. So what's to say that that won't eventually happen again? Um, there are cases where you'll have, say, a factory opening up in a certain town, people moving to that town for these jobs. If in 10 years, those jobs no longer exist, you've got a lot of displaced people it's worrying in that regard. One thing I think is good, they've added guardrails around um, not allowing, say, buybacks of stocks. So okay, okay. Necessarily, um, buy back their own stocks and reward their shareholders, which is good because this should benefit the people and not necessarily the top executives. Overall, it's a little bit of two sides of the coin. I also think that the US spends so much money on subsidy of different industries, including yeah. 
fossil fuel and the meat and dairy industry, which we know are massive contributors to um, climate change. And not enough on things that people are crying out for, like education and healthcare. And I realize it's a little bit of an apples and oranges, maybe a straw man argument there. But I do think that if they've got this money to put somewhere, is there somewhere that's maybe more deserving that the people in general would benefit more from? Yeah, I, I wonder if they have to subsidize it b- b- just because of the fact that if if they didn't, um, the cost of a computer would just would just skyrocket, right? Right, because part of the the appeal of of building them in in, in China or, or wherever is is um, the labor was will obviously be uh, a lot less expensive, and then that that saving can be passed on to the consumer. Um, if if suddenly your iPhone is is five times the price, um, and a subsidy prevents that, that then may, maybe it's it's the option. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not um, coming at it from any side, but um, it's an interesting uh, observation, right? It is. And I'm also not a, a U.S. citizen, so I don't I'm, yeah. I've yeah, no skin in the game here, really. Um, but one thing that I have noticed is so it's a 25 percent tax credit. So someone like yeah. Intel would have to spend 20 billion to get 5 billion back. And the cost of a factory is about 10 billion from what I've read. Um, and they'll get around three back from that. That's still a huge amount of expenditure going into this. And they'll have to make that back some way as well, because these are new factories that we're talking about building. It's not about revamping existing facilities. So that risk could still be there either way. One one thing that's a little bit closer to home rather than the, the States is, is the next article. So UK Parliament closes their TikTok account after China data warning. <laughs> Not to make the entire episode about China, but um, the, the UK Parliament has closed down its TikTok account after MPs raised concerns about the risk of data being passed to the Chinese government. Um, the account has been locked and the content has been deleted days after it was launched. Senior MPs and peers have called for the account to be removed until TikTok give credible assurances that no data could be handled uh, to, to China, to the government. Uh, TikTok is owned, of course, by the Chinese company ByteDance, which has denied it was controlled by the Chinese government. Um, obviously, that's a, that's a very hot topic um, and, and it's been debated many times um, in the past. Um, what, do you, what do you think? Is this an overreaction or is it probably the, the smart thing to do? I think it's probably the smart thing to do. I think I might be the wrong audience for TikTok. I think I'm a little bit too old for that, like an older millennial that missed the TikTok boat. Um, TikTok is an interesting one because the amount of data that it collects on its users is far more than it needs to operate. Um, and I know that we can say the same about the likes of, say, Facebook and Instagram and so on. I think where people are concerned are obviously that's owned by a U.S. company. So it feels like the data is maybe in safer hands, for want of a better word. Um, with TikTok, there was a report carried out by a company called Internet 2.0. I think they're Australian and American joint venture. Okay. This report listed all the different things that TikTok can collect mm. in terms of data. So with US users, it can collect your biometric data. So if you use your face to unlock your phone or your fingerprints, it can collect that. It can collect calendar information. It can get your geolocation every hour. That's a lot of information that it's getting about a person for what is essentially a video upload platform. So I can understand that somebody in government might be wary about how much information is being collected on them, especially, say, like contact lists and sensitive information like that. I think where it is a pity that this is the case and this is the concern is they're obviously trying to reach younger voters. And it's been known for years that younger voter turnout is much, much lower than people in older generations. I think in the 2019 general election, it was Mm. less Fifty percent for people between eighteen and thirty-five or thereabouts. Oh, wow, wow, that's low. Don't quote me on that. That might not be exactly right, but oh, it is yeah. quite low. When you see the trend, obviously goes up as people yeah, yeah. get older and learn more about politics. <clears throat> politics can be also quite a difficult area to get into and to understand because it's so intricate and so complex. So, by having a platform like this, they're obviously trying to reach people in a different kind of way and make information more bite-sized. So it's a shame that that's kind of been taken away. Um, But from a security point of view, given that TikTok is owned by a company that's governed by another country that is considered a country of concern, I understand it. Also in um, TikTok's terms of service, it does say that if it's requested, say, by legal entities or government, it can give the data. So really, oh, wow. Interesting. The, the the amount of data they collect, you're, you're right, it, it's it's staggering. Another thing that they collect is um, your, your keystrokes in terms of where, where you're touching your screen, even when the app's not in use. So in, in theory, they could 
they could just get a keyboard up and see which letters you're what, what you're typing, your passwords, who you're texting messages to. I mean, that's a lot of data to uh, to trust to somebody that you have no idea who, who they are on, on the other side of the world. So, um, yeah, it's probably a good thing for, for the government to be um, nervous of this one. And I remember just what was it, two years ago when, when people were going to just ban TikTok from mm -hmm. like they did with um Huawei the, the phone company was it yeah um and and now it's it's completely reversed it was um I, I saw something that that Trump was going to ban TikTok and, and then TikTok banned Trump um it kind of had a <laughs> had an opposite effect <laughs> there but um the, the interesting thing about TikTok is it's it's so addicting that mm -hmm. almost all the other platforms um were kind of caught out by surprise really and and they're, they're trying to make their own version of it obviously instagram reels um instagram reels is basically a, a clone of of um of tiktok um i had to do another podcast earlier today um where there was a story saying that facebook are, are closing large parts of their development team um they were they had an, uh, a live shopping feature they, they've yeah. scrapped that entire division to, to focus on on facebook reels to uh to try and make a another tiktok clone so even though wow. facebook owns instagram that they're, 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 they're creating multiple versions of of their product to try to you know appeal to, to, to the masses but um yeah I, I mean you can see why it's addicting right you know a, a product like tiktok Completely. And the content is endless. It's designed so that you scroll and scroll and scroll and it's video after video. And because it's video and not pictures, you stay on the platform for longer. So it reinforces that kind of little dopamine rush that you get from like new thing, new thing, new thing. So it's understandable. And the, the algorithm is is so simple. It's, if you stay on the video, it will show you more videos like that one. So it's it's designed to keep you addicted. And and um, if you're a little kid, you know, that's your first exposure to technology. That's a slippery slope, isn't it? I mean, that can that can get you. For sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a wild one. Um, the, the last um, article of the day, um, once again, never, never big tech news. So Twitter, um, your secret Twitter account may no longer be a secret. So somebody out there has gotten hold of a lot of data from Twitter and they're selling it. It's, it's, on, it's online, it's on the, the dark web, it's on the deep web. You can you can buy some uh, some Twitter info. So if you've got a secret Twitter account, we've got some bad news for you. I, I actually have a secret Twitter account, which I use. Um, so uh, bad news for Alfie, I suppose. But um, on, on Friday, Twitter disclosed information about a security vulnerability that allowed someone to find out whether a specific email address or phone number is tied to an existing Twitter account. Um, in January 2022, we received a report through our bug bounty program of a vulnerability in Twitter systems. As a result of the vulnerability, if somebody submitted an email address or phone number to Twitter systems, Twitter systems would tell the person what Twitter account the submitted email address or phone number was associated with if any, um, that's pretty pretty wild, really. I'm, I'm not sure how many they, they they've got. Um, if it's all of them, if it's just it's just a handful of them, but but they're selling the the data online, so it must be worth something. Um, what, what what do you think about this whole <laughs> fiasco? I found this one really interesting, actually, because it's it's not so much the the fact that you can discover somebody's account that is the problem in my mind it's the volume at which they were collected so i believe it was something like five million accounts were okay. straight wow. so the likes of twitter and facebook have always had features where you can put in an email address and find somebody or if you upload your contacts it can show you who you already know on these platforms and that's a key part of their platform to discovering people so that's not new like we've already been able to do that so if you were using your own email address for your secret account then that's kind of on you. I, I've already been caught months ago, probably. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Whereas if you're using a secret email address as well, you're probably all right. Okay. Um, obviously, at the scale that users do it, it's one person at a time or an upload of context where you would have maybe like 50 people and so on. It's much smaller than the scraping. I think what I find really interesting is firstly, like the concept of how do you prevent that happening? Because you need to be able to get accounts based on email addresses either for what I just mentioned finding people or if you're locked out of your account you need to be able to try and find a way to find the account reset your password and so on um, what I do find questionable is if Twitter was made aware of this in January why is it only coming to light now that it's been published and the hacker is threatening to to sell this information they obviously knew about it long before now and that kind of raises the question of companies being held accountable for security breaches 
also makes me wonder as well on the likes of Twitter you can opt out of being searchable based on your email address so some of these people that were found the accounts that were scraped and so on were they people who had opted out and it was a matter of consent but again it just goes back to that question of why did they wait so long to publicize obviously egg on their face it's embarrassing vulnerability was there for seven months before they finally fixed it but I do think there should be more regulation and large influential companies like that having to announce when there is security breaches it, yeah it's, it's crazy they don't ha- have to report that I mean they didn't so they must have legally not had to do it but um surely you'd um you'd think it would have been a requirement right under the U.S. law or, or whatever that, that they would have to do something like that um do, do, do you think it's in, in we've got so many passwords we use so many different apps right do you think like hackings are just inevitable now or or, or you know like is, is there anything that we can do to prevent our twitter pages getting getting found out or is it just like probably just going to be part of part of life from now on i think some of it is we need to have good hygiene on the web ourselves But I also don't want to lay blame at the victim's feet either, because we should also be able to trust the platforms that we're using to safeguard things. So, you know, if you are somebody who is fairly tech savvy, you can set up two factor authentication. You can use different passwords. You can have secure passwords as much as you like. But at the end of the day, we're human. So we are going to use similar passwords from site to site, especially if they're not critical ones, like if it's you're signing up for I know your free first box of wine from Naked Wines, something like that. You're probably not concerned compared to, say, your banking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But I do think that there should be maybe more in place to prevent things like this. So is there a way that you say you could add rate limiting for the amount of times that you can hit the API and scrape this information? Should it only be accessible to accounts that are over a certain amount of months old and so on? Because you could create, say, a botnet to just hit and hit and hit and scrape as much information as possible. But are there other ways that we can kind of set up guards around that? Maybe that's that's the question. Cool. Well, look, thank you so much, um, Laura, for, for coming on. It's been awesome to, to get your thoughts on, on what's happening in the world, um, especially from, from your angle of, of understanding things um, through that lens as well. Um, would love to get you back on in the future. It'd be awesome to, to hear your opinions again in a, in a couple of months on, on what else is happening. Um, but thanks very much for, for coming on. Thank you to everybody for, for watching. Make sure that you follow on, um, on Spotify for more episodes. We've got them coming almost daily now um, in video format. Um, and uh, and yeah, thanks for thanks for being part of the the show. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and it's been great to to have these different little nuggets to, to pick awesome. apart with you. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Imagine if you were able to hire the next Elon Musk, or if you got a job at Facebook back when it was just a startup. Well, these people. And these opportunities, they are still out there, and we have access to them. Access to all of them. At Alpha Technology, we specialise in software development recruitment across London and the UK. From React to Java to C Sharp and more, we represent the best front end, back end, and full-stack engineers on the market. This includes top developers from Meta, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and more. Our clients operate across AI, blockchain, VR, AR, fintech, edtech, healthtech, and more. From startups to global enterprises and everything in between. But Alpha isn't just a recruitment agency. We are also a tech community. We host podcasts, run meetup events, and lead EDI initiatives, supporting women in technology, BAME individuals, and the tech for good ecosystem. So, if you're a company looking to hire software engineers, or if you're a developer open to new opportunities yourself, then we are here to help. Alpha Technology. Recruiting for the future.